here talking about veins. And, you know, we talk about how veins are the vessels that help bring blood back towards the heart. And uh, they basically help drain capillaries, you know, so the blood that goes from capillaries will go into veins. And the pressure in veins is much lower than arteries. We know this because veins are farthest from the heart, right? And blood pressure decreases the farther and farther and farther away you get from the heart. In fact, there is still some pressure in veins, but it's fairly low. And veins don't pulse, right? You don't find pulse pressure in veins. There's one steady blood pressure in a vein and that kind of slowly decreases over time and distance. But if your veins typically don't pulse, unless you're seeing things like heart failure, where blood's backing up and going back into a vein. Um, now, we call veins these blood reservoirs, and like a reservoir for water, they store blood, right? So um, blood reservoirs, in, or like your veins, we also call these capacitance vessels because they have capacity to store a lot of your blood. In fact, at rest, your veins store about 60% of your body's blood. That can change, though. Like during exercise, you can take more of the blood from your venous end and get that into your arterial end by, you know, increasing venous return. And we'll talk about those factors that influence venous return. Now, we, we talked about earlier about how the venules are the smallest of your veins. These things come after at the end of the capillary bed where all those capillaries converge into a venule. Um, the smallest are these post-capillary venules. And it's at the venule end that blood pressure is low enough and blood flow is low enough for diapedesis to occur. And diapedesis is where immune cells can leave the bloodstream and start to enter an infected tissue. So we'll talk about that, that sort of information in more detail in the lymphatic system, but there are some immune cells like monocytes and neutrophils and other, other immune cells can actually leave your bloodstream, other, you know, those leukocytes, and they can leave and then enter an infected tissue through diapedesis. Now, venules converge to form veins, and these veins are larger than venules. We have small to medium-sized veins that travel next to muscular arteries. These are going to have valves that prevent pooling of blood. They prevent backflow of blood. Basically, these, ven these venous valves are a layer or infolding of tunica intima that kind of folds in on itself, and it prevents backflow of blood. It's a one-way valve. That way, blood can actually go in towards the heart instead of flowing and pooling back in, like in your legs or you know some other peripheral tissue. Now there's two main factors that influence the direction of venous blood flow. Um, for one, we know that blood only flows from high to low pressure, right? And I'm not talking about like super high blood pressure or super low blood pressure. If there's any kind of pressure difference, blood will move in that direction. So if you if you have higher pressure, you know, in a particular vein and lower pressure somewhere else blood will move from high to low pressure. But you might wonder, well, where does that pressure come from? Well, you can get pressure changes due to skeletal muscle activity and your respiratory activity, your breathing activity. So we have what's called a skeletal muscle pump and a respiratory pump that can influence changes in venous pressure that can influence changes in venous flow. But what what's helps establish a unidirectional type of venous flow are the fact that we have valves. So uh, looking here, you guys, we have our skeletal muscle pump on the left, respiratory pump on the right. So we'll first talk about the, our skeletal muscle pump. It turns out that a lot of our veins travel right next to skeletal muscles. You know, the superficial veins you find in the dermis and maybe some of the, um, you know, hypodermis, they're not going to be that close to, to skeletal muscles, but some of your larger veins are found either right on top of a skeletal muscle or even in the skeletal muscle itself. That way, when skeletal muscles contract and they start to bulge outward, they can actually start to squeeze on a nearby vein. And it's the squeezing on this nearby vein that increases the pressure in that particular patch of vein, right? Now, if you increase blood pressure in this patch of vein and you have lower pressure up here, then blood's going to flow in that direction, right? But what if you increase pressure in this patch of vein due to squeezing, but there's lower pressure down here? Well, luckily, we have valves that prevent backflow. That way, you don't just squeeze blood in both directions. When that skeletal muscle contracts, it'll squeeze on the vein, and then blood's only pushed up in the, in the direction of these valves, if that makes sense, from high to low pressure. So the, just using your skeletal muscles itself helps increase blood flow back to the heart. In fact, the people that, that you see, um, those like the royal guards out, outside of England, you know, they stand in position for hours on end, just kind of like guarding, or it's more of a ceremonial thing. But, you know, they, they just kind of stand there, that you'd, you'd expect that if they're just standing there, why doesn't their venous blood just pool in their legs and they want to just pass out then? 
Well, what they've done, the, 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 what they do then, is they've trained themselves to learn how to milk their veins. So what they do is they very ever so slightly contract their, their leg muscles, like their thigh and leg muscles. And by contra contracting those muscles, they can squeeze on their veins and increase venous return to the heart without actually having to move their footing, right? So just by standing still, you can kind of squeeze on your muscles and actually, um, I'm sorry, you can contract muscles, it'll squeeze on your veins, which actually helps milk those veins. It squeezes on them, which causes blood to move in a particular direction, right? Well, it's going to be highest pressure where the vein's being squeezed upon by the skeletal muscle, and you'll find lower pressure, you know, up near the heart. So that blood, then, it gets squeezed up towards the heart due to that change in pressure. We call it the skeletal muscle pump. Now, you know, that's, that's if you're standing still. Otherwise, if you're just normally moving and walking around, the fact that you're moving and walking around or just moving at all itself also aids in the return of venous blood back to the heart, okay? Now, you might wonder, well, why does the venous blood just move to pressure, like blood pressure? Well, it does, but remember, blood pressure in veins is so low that you're not going to get a whole lot of blood flow due to that blood pressure alone. So what you need then is a skeletal muscle pump to help squeeze those veins and milk that blood back towards the heart, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, in fact, have you guys ever seen those videos where it's like at a wedding or some sort of ceremony where you might have to stand for a long period of time? And then all of a sudden, like the groom passes out or like the bride passes out. They just faint, just kind of keel over. Um, you know, they might be nervous and they forget to breathe or something. But it could also be if it's like a, you know, like a Catholic wedding or something. It's like hours and they're standing there, <laughs> you know, and blood starts pooling in your legs, you know, and then you actually get less venous return to the heart, which decreases your cardiac output. And then you end up fainting because your blood pressure drops out. Exactly. Um, now, another way you can increase venous return to the heart is this respiratory pump. And like the skeletal muscle pump, it all also relies on changes in pressure. So you'll notice here, uh, there's two different states of the thorax. We have during inhalation and during exhalation. Okay. Now, during inhalation, what's your thoracic wall doing when you inhale really deeply? It's expanding, right? And you're increasing the volume of your thorax. So when you increase the volume of your thorax, it actually decreases the pressure. So if you have lower pressure in the large veins of your thorax than the veins elsewhere, which way is blood going to flow? Towards the thorax. So just inhaling helps draw venous blood also towards your heart because you're decreasing pressure in the thorax. Just like expanding your thorax also draws air into your lungs for the same purpose, for the same reason. It also draws blood back towards your heart. Now, what's interesting too, you guys, is that during exhalation, you see that there's actually um, uh, a, a, a release of compression here, which also helps to force blood back up towards your heart. So just the fact that you're ventilating during inhalation and exhalation helps draw venous blood towards the heart. That, that, that's, what, that's what we call the respiratory pump. So like, what if somebody's sitting on your chest and you can't really expand your thoracic wall very well? How are you going to return venous blood to your heart? Yeah, not very well, right? So, um, you know, so if, if someone, if you can't expand your thoracic wall, then you're going to get less venous return to the heart, which can decrease your cardiac output, decrease your blood pressure, and then you can, you can faint, right, or pass out. So it's kind of interesting. So uh, does someone want to describe to me, like, what the skeletal muscle pump does? How does that work? Good. It's got skeletal muscle contractions that, yeah, they kind of squeeze on a vein, and that squeezing on the vein pushes blood in a particular direction. Why doesn't it get pushed in both directions? Valves. You got valves, exactly. So it squeeze on it, but it, goes, it just gets pushed in one direction. Good. Um, how about the respiratory pump? When you inhale, what happens to thoracic volume and pressure? Volume increases, but thoracic pressure decreases. And if you have lower pressure in the vena cava, then what happens then is blood then moves from high to low pressure, right? And then during exhalation, uh, what we find then is that due to a, a release of this compression, and uh, you also get some blood that also will get drawn upwards too, because then you get a low, you get lower pressure now in the abdominal veins, so that blood in the periphery also gets kind of um, drawn upwards to the area of lower compression during during uh, or sorry lower pressure during exhalation. So now we're going to do is move on to, to blood pressure. And uh, blood pressure, the way we define this, you guys, is it's the amount of force that's being exerted on the vessel wall from the inside, okay? 
because we know that fluids can be compressed. You know, when you think of like a fluid pressure, like the pressure inside of a soda can, well, that's compressed fluid, right? Or the pressure inside of a squirt gun, that's compressed fluid too. The tendency then is for that compressed fluid to want to expand because the molecules don't like being that close together. They start bouncing together and they, they want to bounce away from each other. And that bouncing of those molecules creates an outward force that is the compression. I'm sorry, that is the blood pressure in there. So that blood pressure is just basically fluid compression of your blood. But it, when it wants to expand, it's it kind of expanding outward. and It's putting that force onto your vessel wall. That's what we can measure as blood pressure. So when we measure the degree of force being transmitted on the wall of your blood vessel, we call that blood pressure. It's just a force per unit area. Um, you know, we can standardize the, the units here. We, just, we talk about blood pressure in millimeters of mercury, right, NMHG. Um, and you can measure through a variety of techniques. You know, you have like a sphygmomanometer. Uh, you can say it really fast. It's kind of a tongue twister, right? Um, sphygmometer. <laughs> um, but you can also do intra-aortic or intra-arterial blood pressure readings too. That takes a more of a digital type of device that requires you to get inside of a blood vessel and you can measure more minute and precise changes in blood pressure that way, like in, internally. But that obviously requires like surgical procedures. Where they usually enter for that kind of situation, you guys, would be the radial artery. So, because it's so superficial, you get in through, through the radial artery, put in a catheter, and then draw that catheter up the radial artery back towards brachial artery, axillary, subclavian, and then even into the aorta. So you can actually measure pressure in the aorta from inside of that aorta. Um, otherwise, externally, you see this blood pressure cuff. Now, we know that our blood pressure, at least in arteries, has a systolic and diastolic pressure. Systolic pressure is generated while the ventricles are in systole, or in contraction. Diastolic pressure is the pressure that remains during diastole, or relaxation. And then, uh, what was the, what state did we spend most time in? Systole or diastole? Diastole, diastole. 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 yeah, exactly. In fact, we spend twice as much time in diastole than systole. So diastolic pressure has the greatest influence over your average blood pressure than your systolic pressure. This is one of the reasons why if someone's diastolic pressure is really high, that's a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease versus systolic pressure. Like if someone's systolic pressure is high, but their diastolic is low, that's not as risky than if someone had a high systolic and a, and a high diastolic, right? Because we spend more time in diastole, then that has an a greater influence on the average blood pressure, which we call mean arterial pressure, or MAP. Um, now, it turns out that we have this systolic and diastolic pressure. That's the pulse, right? So the, the peak of that wave of a pulse is systolic pressure, and the trough of that wave of pulse is the diastolic pressure. Now, these pulsatile nature of, of blood pressure continues until you get towards arterials, but it disappears by the time you get to capillaries. So capillaries don't pulse, okay? In fact, everything downstream of a capillary also doesn't pulse. So venules, medium-sized veins, large veins, none of those pulse. You just get one average sort of blood pressure in those vessels. Okay? Now, um, uh, blood pressure decreases from the aorta all the way back to vena cava, right? So why is blood pressure the highest in the aorta? Because it's closest to the heart. You got it. Closest to the heart, and it's the heart that generated that blood pressure. And it's lowest in the vena cava... Because it's the most downstream vessel. It's kind of confusing to say that it's farthest from the heart because it's also close because it also dumps in the heart, but it's farthest from where the pressure was generated initially. So that's why pressure is super low in the vena cava. What also keeps pressure low in the vena cava is the fact that the heart's, the heart's pumping that blood along and it's decreasing pressure as it draws that fluid forward. So it's kind of interesting. Did you want to add something? No? Okay. Um, so what we see on this slide, you guys, is, is basically blood pressure from larger elastic arteries all the way to your vena cava. So looking at your aorta, we see our diastolic and systolic pressures. What's this little blip here, you guys? We see... Oh, this last one? What's this little... Why is it... Why is it... We get a little hump there. Why isn't it just like a smooth, like, sawtooth pattern? What happens when um, what happens when ventricular pressure gets below aortic pressure? Oh, that's the valve closing. Yeah, which valve? The semi semilunar. semilunar. And the semilunar valves close with so much force. Remember that creates a little dip. There you go. That's the dichrotic notch. You can see it right there. 
So diacritic notch. So um, we see diastolic pressure is near 80, systolic is near 120, right? And you can still get this pulsatile nature of blood pressure until you get to, to smaller and smaller vessels. So some of your like muscular arteries still have pulses. Um, even arterioles still have a pulse. Mm -hmm. But eventually this pulse disappears, and then we just get one sort of fluid, uh, continuous blood pressure from capillaries all the way through veins. So what's important to note is that veins don't pulse. If this vessel's pulsing, it's probably not a vein. Okay. Now, under some abnormal circumstances, veins can carry a pulse, but that would be due to a backflow of blood. Like if the right side of your heart's failing, and when it pumps, instead of pumping blood to the lungs, let's say if it starts backing up in veins, then you start to see jugular venous pulse, that kind of stuff. But that's not a normal condition, and we'll talk about that, talk about that more so in pathophysiology. Okay. Now, uh, why do you guys think this pulse disappears? Why doesn't it just stay forever? Nice. There's less elastic tissue in capillaries, right? There, in fact, there's no elastic tissue in capillaries. Bless you. <laughs> there's no elastic tissue in capillaries, so capillaries don't expand or contract. They stay the same shape or size. And as the blood pressure decreases, any differences like in systolic and diastolic pressure start to kind of wash out. They kind of disappear, and then what you end up with is just one kind of steady pressure. Um, so where is the most significant changes in blood pressure? Where do you guys see that here? Like where's the steepest curve here? Yeah, arteri arterials seem to have this, the steepest slope here, right? Especially in capillaries too. Look at from the, the arterial end of a capillary bed to the venule end of the capillary bed. Look at that. But then you guys see on veins, it just kind of slowly starts to kind of, the slope becomes less and less severe. And so you get kind of a slope that's closer to zero. Now, um... Why am I talking about slope here? Well, blood only flows from high to low pressure. So if you have a large difference in pressure, then you get the most blood flow. So where, are you gonna get, where do you see a lot of blood flow then? Yeah, in capillaries, absolutely. And the art, artery end. Where is blood flow going to be slower then? Yeah, the veins. And you can see this here because there's, there's smaller differences in pressure so that blood moves more slowly as well. Um, yeah? So is that why you get deep? One of the reasons, yeah. Uh, great question. So we'll talk about this back in pathophysiology later, but one of the factors that influences deep vein thrombi is the fact that venous blood is more slow to move. And we learned that venous blood, if it's if it has stasis or kind of stagnant, it's more likely to clot. So good point. Now, in terms of maintaining blood pr pressure, you guys, it's all the cooperation of a variety of organ systems. And this, to me, is one of the reasons why I think blood pressure regulation is so cool, because it requires several different organisms to maintain. Okay? Um, did I say organisms? I meant organ systems. <laughs> so organ systems to maintain, not organisms. <laughs> so it involves your heart, your blood vessels, and your kidneys. At least I didn't say another word. <laughs> So your heart helps maintain blood pressure um, because it influences cardiac output. Your blood pressure, I'm sorry, your blood vessels maintain blood pressure because they maintain resistance, and your kidneys maintain blood pressure because they maintain blood volume. So it's these three major factors then that help influence uh, blood pressure. So what organ system maintains cardiac output? Your heart does, right? Part of your cardiovascular system. Or peripheral resistance is maintained by your blood vessels, right, like muscular arteries and arterioles, and then how about blood volume? Kidneys. The kidneys, exactly, because we know that your, if your kidneys filter a lot of your blood and then you end up urinating a lot, then you're losing blood volume, right? If you're losing water through urine, then that's actually water that came from blood. What if your kidneys help you, if, they, if you actually per, make less urine, like if you make a more highly concentrated form of urine? Volume. Yeah, then you're holding on to your body's water, which means that you're not actually losing that much blood volume. So it's the cooperation of these three organ systems that helps us maintain blood pressure. And it, all of this occurs in real time, you guys. It's not like one is only the one that's influencing. It's all three. So your heart, your blood vessels, and your kidneys work together to maintain a steady blood pressure under even changing conditions. Now, um, some of these are quicker than others, right? Like, do you guys think that your that your kidneys are as quick as like your blood vessels to change no. blood pressure? Probably not, right? Like blood, 
uh, blood vessels can change their diameter pretty quickly because that's just muscle. Whereas your kidneys, that's a filtration mechanism that's going to take longer to occur. So long-term regulation of blood pressure is mediated by the kidneys. Short-term regulation of blood pressure is mediated by blood vessels and your heart because those are really fast. So um, what this slide shows, again, you guys, then are some relationships of things like flow to pressure and resistance, cardiac output to pressure and resistance, or pressure to cardiac output and resistance. So uh, we talked about how there was a relationship of flow and resistance, right? And that's what we see here. So flow is equal to the change in pressure over resistance. Let's just say that this change in pressure is constant. So we'll just say that you know, it's not that important to talk about. But it, we, do not, we know that blood flow is due to, due to change or a difference in pressure. But let's just say that that remains steady. How can you change your resistance then to increase flow? Would you want to make R a smaller number or a large number? To increase flow. You got it. Yeah. If you make R a resistance a smaller number, you decrease resistance, then it increases flow. It makes F a larger number, right? Like if you divide by 1 instead of dividing by 2, then dividing by 1 gives you a larger number. Which, which basically means you have more flow, right? So what's the relationship of resistance to vessel diameter? If you increase the vessel diameter. Nice. If you increase vessel diameter, you decrease resistance, which then would do what to flow? Increase flow. Awesome. Very good, you guys. Perfect. How about if you vasoconstricted? It decreases vessel diameter, right? What would that do to... Increase resistance and decrease, decrease flow. flow. Very good. Now, what about cardiac output to this whole system too? Well, um, cardiac output does play a role, um, or just actually is influenced by change in pressure and resistance. So, if you increase resistance, what does it do to cardiac output? Decreases it. In fact, check this out, you guys. You guys notice this is the same equation for flow and cardiac output. In fact, what is cardiac? How do we define cardiac output? Yeah, heart rate times stroke volume, which gives us a, a number. What's that number that cardiac output tells us? The rate of flow. The rate of flow in a minute. So cardiac output's the amount of blood your heart pumps out in a minute, which is flow. So cardiac output is blood flow, right? So if you increase the resistance of vessels, what does it do to cardiac output? It decreases, it decreases the, the flow. flow. Exactly. It decreases cardiac output or flow. These, these are really saying the same thing. Um, now, we can also see that there's a relationship of change in pressure to cardiac output and resistance. In fact, this is our blood pressure equation. Blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. But when we talk about resistance, we're talking about total peripheral resistance, not just resist resistance due to your vessel diameter, but also resistance due to viscosity of blood, the length of that blood vessel. Okay. So if you increase resistance, what does it do to blood pressure? Increases it, right? How about if you increase cardiac output? What does it do to blood pressure? Increases it. Good. So you see that these are proportional. So if you decrease your cardiac output, decreases blood pressure. Decrease resistance, decreases blood pressure. That's what this is saying here, you guys. So blood pressure is cardiac output times total peripheral resistance, which is PR here, or TPR. And so um, cardiac output also depends on blood volume. So we talked about how your kidneys help regulate your blood volume. And if you urinate a lot, what's that going to do to your blood's volume? It decreases your blood volume. I'll tell you just right now that that would also decrease your cardiac output. So just kind of jumping, kind of tying this all together, you guys. If you urinate a lot and it decreases your blood volume, what's that going to do to your blood pressure? Decreases it. Exactly. Because small, less blood volume decreases cardiac output. If you decrease cardiac output, it decreases blood pressure. So this is why if someone has hypertension, you could put them on like a, you know, a diuretic because it improves their water loss. And if they're losing more water from their bloodstream, then they're lowering their blood pressure, right? So you hear about like ACE inhibitors or thiazide-like inhibitors or loop diuretics. Like these are all things that can actually uh, reduce cardiac output by reducing your blood volume and therefore decrease blood pressure. So it's kind of cool. Now, uh, blood pressure then varies directly with cardiac output, resistance, and volume. When we say varies directly, it means they're proportional. So if you increase cardiac output, what does it do to blood pressure? Increase blood pressure. Increase blood pressure. If you increase peripheral resistance, 
increases blood pressure. And if you increase blood volume, it increases blood pressure. Good. So what organ regulates cardiac output? The heart. Your heart, right? How about peripheral resistance? Blood vessels. Vessels and then blood volume? Kidneys. Kidneys. Good. So you guys notice that your heart, blood vessels, and kidneys all work together to maintain blood pressure. So it's kind of cool. Um, now, a change in one variable can be quickly compensated by another. So like, let's say if all of a sudden, like if your blood vessels vasodilated, you know, and you might expect that just due to that vasodilation, you would decrease resistance and decrease pressure. But if that were the only factor, your blood pressure might de decrease way too much, right? You might not have good blood flow then. So what can happen then is that your kidneys and heart then can act to reverse that change. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, sort of a stability of blood pressures maintained by all three of those organ systems, your heart, blood vessels, so your cardiovascular system, as well as your urinary system or kidneys. So all those work together to maintain blood pressure. So uh, we learned earlier back in the heart, you guys, that cardiac output was stroke volume times heart rate. And what was stroke volume again? The amount of blood that's ejected from your heart in one beat. So stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected from your heart in one beat times beats per minute, which is heart rate. That gives you, so then what happens then is beats cancel out, right? So then what you end up with then is liters per minute, or basically the amount of blood that's ejected from your heart in each minute, which is cardiac output. And if it's 5 to 5.5 5 liters, like what's that with respect to your blood volume? That is your blood volume, right? And this is at rest. So normal cardiac output at rest is about 5 liters or so, which is a uh, you know, on average, like an average blood volume. So it's pretty amazing. Now, cardiac output is determined by things like venous return. And what are the what are the two main factors that influence venous return? We talked about earlier. Skeletal, yeah, skeletal muscle pump, pump respiratory pump. Because guess what, you guys? If you increase venous return, you increase your ventricular and diastolic volume. And we learned about how stroke volume was EDV minus ESV. So if you have more venous return, then you're increasing your EDV which increases your stroke volume. And that was the Frank Starling law. If you had more preload, more stretch on those ventricles, that increased the contractility of the ventricles, so it increases stroke volume. Um, now, resting heart rate is determined by, by uh, basically the brainstem, like the cardio inhibitory and cardio accelatory centers of your brainstem. But if it's at rest, what we find is it's the parasympathetic vagus nerves that limit your heart's rate. Right? What would be the normal heart rate due to the SA node in the absence of any kind of nerve input? 100 beats per minute, right? With your vagus nerves attached to your heart, what do your vagus nerves slow down your heart rate to? Yeah, around 70 or so, right? It can vary within that within 60 to 100, but it'll be around 70 or so. So um, we talked about how stroke volume is also regulated by venous return, right? So if you have more venous blood being returned to your right ventricle more quickly, then you're increasing the volume of blood that fills that ventricle. And if you have more blood in the ventricle, the ventricles can contract more strongly. That was the Frank Starling law. When they're stretched, they contract more strongly. If they contract more strongly, then you're ejecting more blood out in every single beat, which is basically increasing stroke volume. So if you increase your venous return, you increase your stroke volume. So then theoretically, right, or hypothetically, based on what we're learning here, if you increase your venous return, what should that do to your blood pressure? It should increase it, right? Let's let's work through this. You increase venous return, it increases your ventricular and diastolic volume, which increases stroke volume. If you increase stroke volume, what does it do to cardiac output? It increases cardiac output. If you increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure. Blood pressure. Good. So it's kind of interesting. So what this means then is if you just start squeezing on your legs and breathing heavily, that should increase your blood pressure, right? But there are other organs at play like blood vessels and kidneys. So I mean, if we could somehow isolate that effect, that should increase blood pressure. But it'd be interesting to test that sometime. <laughs> um, what this slide shows you guys are basically just all those factors we talked about. So exercise would increase venous return, right? Because if you're moving your limbs around, you're squeezing on veins more strongly, you're going to force that venous blood back to your heart more quickly. And if you're exercising, you're breathing more heavily, right? Both of those increase venous return. That increases ventricular and diastolic volume which increases stroke volume. And if you increase stroke volume, this increases cardiac output. Good. So what about other factors? Well, if you're, um, you know, if you're exercising, you're having an increase in sympathetic activity and a decrease in, in parasympathetic activity. 
And by decreasing your parasympathetic activity, that can increase heart rate, right? Same thing with increasing sympathetic activity also increases heart rate by acting on beta-1 receptors. If you increase heart rate, what does it do to cardiac output? Increases, increases cardiac output. If you increase cardiac output, increases. increases blood pressure. You got it. So what about uh, over here, you guys? If you increase sympathetic activity, you got more epinephrine. Epinephrine not only increases heart rate, but it also in increases heart muscle contractility. If your heart muscle contracts more strongly, what does it do to the volume of blood that's left behind after contraction? You have less, right? Yeah, there's less blood left behind the ventricles at the end of contraction, which we say ESV is now lower. Now, we know that stroke volume is EDV minus ESV. So if you make ESV a smaller number, that means that you have a larger stroke volume. And if you increase stroke volume, then you increase cardiac output. 